All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Allie Michaels, and I'm the Technology Advancement Manager with Launch Tennessee. Um, if you're not already familiar with us, Launch Tennessee is a statewide organization that's working to make Tennessee the best state in the nation for startups. Um, through facilitating capital formation, market building, um, and resource connection through our network partners. And if you're not familiar with this already, I would encourage you to learn more at launchtn.org. Part of our work includes hosting opportunities like this one to help companies in Tennessee be successful in their SBIR and SPPR applications. So I'm excited to introduce to you today, Peter Atherton, SBIR and SPPR Program Director for the National Science Foundation. Peter comes to the NSF with a broad background in the physical sciences and extensive experience in technology development and commercialization. Before joining NSF, Peter was originally CEO and most recently C CTO at Nico Corporation, a publicly traded company that he founded in Sydney, Australia. While at Nico Corporation, he was instrumental in developing and commercializing technologies in a range of fields, including diffractive optics, laser-based marking, radio frequency identification, and internet-based personal authentication. Prior to Miko, he spent seven years at the Overseas Telecommunications Commission where he managed optical fiber communications R&D. While at OTC, his research group made world-leading advances in high-speed optical communications technologies, some of which were commercialized via spin-off companies. He also managed the externally contracted development and commercialization of a number of optical fiber and optoelectronic technologies and was instrumental in establishing a commercialization center for specialized optical fibers at the University of Sydney. He moved to the US in 1998 to further develop the company's technologies and markets. Uh, Peter holds a PhD in physics and a Bachelor of Engineering, both from the University of Queensland. Um, so each year, NSF awards $200 million in funding to entrepreneurs across the country. And today, Peter's going to provide an overview of the program and answer all of your NSF SBIR questions. So on the right of your screen, you'll see the chat function, which you're free to use, um, as well as the Q&A section. So please use this Q&A feature to ask your questions um, so that after the presentation, Peter can see them and respond. Uh, please be sure to mute, use the Q&A and not the chat to ask your questions so that Peter um, can see them and keep track of them. There's also the opportunity to upvote another's question. So if you um, want to hear the answer to someone else's question, be sure to do that also. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Peter and let him take it from here. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Ellie. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Okay, great. So let me share my screen. And... Okay, so I think share this and then I'll So Ellie, can you see that now? Okay, so I hope everyone can see this presentation. There should be a, an opening slide of a presentation here. Um, so as Ali said, I'm Peter Asset, and I'm one of the program directors um, in the NSF uh, SBIR and STTR program. So what I'd like to do is talk for the next 15, 20 minutes or so about the program, give you some background and an overview, and then I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, so first though, a little bit about the National Science Foundation. I guess most of you are familiar with it, but I'll just give you a little bit of background. So as you probably know, NSF supports research uh, across all areas of science and engineering, and in fact, education as well. And NSF is broadly speaking, broken out into directorates, as you can see in this slide here. So NSF's annual budget is uh, a little over $8 billion of which something, this, these numbers are a little bit old, but somewhere near, uh, this year it'll be near to $300 million, uh, is allocated to the Division of Industrial Innovation and Partnerships, which is actually inside the Engineering Directorate. Um, and IIP, as it's called, uh, has a mission of promoting uh, technology translation, technology partnerships, and generally creating 
um, positive economic and societal impact uh, based on high-tech innovations. And so if you look inside the IIP division, there are a number of programs. Uh, first of all, there's the SBIR, STTR program, which is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, but there are several other programs in this division as well. Uh, the Innovation Core or i -Core program is housed in this division. You're probably familiar with the i -Core program. Uh, these other programs you may or may not be familiar with, but they're actually very impactful programs. Uh, Partnerships for Innovation is another one, which is kind of upstream of the SBIR, STTR program. Uh, the Industry University Cooperative Research Centers program is housed inside the IIP division. This is a a program that's been running for, I think, about 40 years now. It's uh, nationwide and uh, creates an enormous amount of impact. And then there are two very influential supplements that are managed uh, foundation-wide from the IIP division, the, the so-called goalie and intern supplements, both of which are, uh, are very impactful in the areas in which they operate. But what I want to do now is talk a little bit more about the SBIR and STTR program. So in case you're not familiar with it, SBIR stands for Small Business Innovation Research. STTR stands for Small Business Technology Transfer. These two programs are very similar in their structure. Really the only difference between the two programs um, is that STTR programs are really geared towards spinning technologies out of universities. That's the primary difference between these two programs. But proposals submitted to the two programs are reviewed together. So the review criteria are just the same. And so in financial year 2018, this program spent about $197 million in funding uh, high tech startups and early stage companies. I think the funding this year is more like 220 to 230 million. So it's increasing steadily. And the purpose of the program is to fund, as I say, high tech startup companies and early stage companies to develop new high impact, um, high risk technical innovations that have the potential to be commercially successful and also societally impactful. And so a company that applies to the program and receives funding in phase one and phase two, and I'll come back to this in just a moment and goes all the way through the program, takes advantage of all the major supplements, uh, will, by the time it leaves the program, the company will have received around about $2 million in research and development funding. And as I say, the program is aimed at funding transformative deep tech innovations. Uh, the ultimate objective of the program, of course, is to create uh, national benefits, so economic benefits, societal benefit, and so forth. But to do that, of course, these innovations have to have the potential to form the basis of a uh, a commercially viable company. And so we look for that possibility when we review proposals. So as I mentioned a moment ago, we have two phases of funding in this program. If you look across the government, there are many different SBIR programs. Um, some of them are contract-based. Uh, this program at the NSF is a grant or award-based program. It's not a contract-based program. You will notice though that some of the contract-based programs have three phases of funding. We have two phases of funding, um, but we have supplements at phase two. So all companies must enter the program at phase one. We do not have a direct to phase two option as some agencies do. Um, and the purpose of a phase one project with us in the SBIR STTR program is to establish technical feasibility of a new high risk or leading edge technology innovation that the company proposes to develop to, to address a market opportunity. So it's up to the company to uh, present the market opportunity and also the technology that they propose to develop to address that market opportunity. So a phase one project is uh, for a duration of between six and 12 months, and you can nominate the duration in the proposal. Uh, companies that need more time, of course, can apply for what's, what we call a no-cost extension, which, as the name suggests, is just extending the, the, the project at no additional cost to NSF. Uh, maximum funding at phase one is $256,000. Um, and companies that complete phase one can apply for phase two funding. Now, phase two uh, used to be basically an extension of phase one, but phase two is now a separate application uh, process to a, to a dedicated phase two solicitation. 
And so you have to apply it's a competitive process, just like phase one. Uh, the purpose of a phase two award is to take the work that was done in phase one, which is mostly about, at phase one, it's mostly about establishing technical feasibility. And then if you su succeed in phase one in doing that, and you can convince a phase two review panel that you're on the right track as far as technical development is concerned, and you do receive a phase two award, the purpose of the phase two award is to continue that work towards developing, towards commercialization, basically. So towards developing prototypes, proof of concepts and so forth, undertaking pilot programs with commercial partners, things of that nature. And so uh, a phase two award is nominally for a duration of 24 months. Uh, mind you, a lot of phase two awards are completed faster than that. And of course, in some cases, if the technology just by its nature takes longer to develop, companies might need more than two years to undertake their phase two project, and that's fine. Um, the base award amount at phase two is a million dollars, and then we have a number of supplements available at phase two. The largest of these supplements is what we call our phase two B supplement, and this is a supplement in which, in which we will match 50 cents in the dollar, any third party investment uh, funds and or sales revenue that the company has earned uh, since the start of the phase one project. So, but it's gotta be a consequence of the funding that we have provided to the company to develop the technologies that were proposed in phase one. So anything since the start of phase one, uh, including third party investments like VC investments, angel investments and so forth, and or sales revenue can be aggregated together and the company can receive uh, a phase two B match of up to $500,000. So if a company, for example, receives investment money of a million dollars or more, which is qualifying. That is to say, it's a consequence of the work that we funded and it's true th truly third party investment funds and new money into the company since the start of the phase one award, then that company would qualify for a $500,000 phase 2B match. It's still a competitive process at phase 2B, but the company would qualify to apply for phase 2B funding of $500,000 in that scenario, or it could be a million dollars or more based on sales revenue or a combination of uh, sales revenue and investment funds. So when you take advantage of the phase, if you take advantage of the phase 2B and all the other uh, supplements that are available at phase two, uh, the total amount of funding going right the way through the program is roughly $2 million. So, you know, it's not a ton of money, but if you're a startup company, I mean, I've been there, I know what it's like. It can, it can be enough at the earliest stages to make a massive difference. So I mentioned that the program is focused on funding startup companies and very early stage companies. And the reason that we fo have this focus is, I guess, twofold. First of all, this is public money and uh, we want the money to have maximum impact. And so generally speaking, we will have maximum impact if we fund a company when they, when it's difficult for them to get money anywhere else. Okay, so uh, the focus therefore is on startup and early stage companies. And you know, the, the flip side to that, uh, which is the other sort of justification for us focusing on early stage companies, is that we fund deep technologies. We fund high risk technical innovations. And early on, it's very, very difficult uh, for companies to find significant funding sources for these types of innovations. And so this program is one of the few places in the country that com companies can come for you know, any significant funding for deep technology uh, development. There are some um, VCs that specialize in this area, but mostly investors are not comfortable with technical risk, whereas we are comfortable with technical risk, as long as there's a credible research and development plan to de-risk uh, the proposed innovation. Anyway, so I've got some stats here from a recent phase one cycle, which kind of emphasized the point that we focus on startup companies and early stage companies. So in this particular uh, phase one cohort, 91% of these companies had never received any SBIR or STTR phase two funding from any agency, not just NSF, but from any agency. 85% um, of the companies at the time they received their phase one award had five or fewer employees. 72% uh, of them have, had been founded in the prior three years. And I can tell you from experience in my topics, it's often in the prior few months. Um, in fact, sometimes com companies are founded primarily to be able to apply to the program. 
And then <clears throat> more than 75% of these companies uh, were first time winners of an SBIR or STTR award. So this just emphasizes the point that we are really focused on startup companies and very early stage companies. We're looking to apply this money where it will have maximum impact, where it'll really move the needle for the company. Um, I've got some numbers here regarding uh, assessment of the program. So we try and assess how well the program is doing. It's actually very difficult because it's very difficult to measure impact, uh, impact, you know, economic impact, societal impact and so forth it comes in many different forms. And so it's very difficult uh, to quantify this in many cases. <clears throat> and so we often end up just measuring what we can measure. And so doing that, um, we, for example, keep track as best we can of uh, exits, uh, capital raises and so forth. And we know that since uh, 2014, and these numbers are as of uh, February of last year, but uh, as uh, since 2014, our companies have raised, uh, would be now well in excess of $9 billion in follow on um, equity financing. And we're aware of, uh, at that point, we were aware of 107, the number is higher now, but we're aware of more than 107 successful exits. Usually these are via acquisition. Uh, sometimes it's via mergers and occasionally it's via IPOs, uh, but usually it's acquisitions. And so I think the, you know, the program is successful by any reasonable measure. Okay, so if you're interested in applying to the program, as I mentioned, all companies must apply initially for phase one funding, but there's a step before that. So we have a, a process called the project pitch process. Uh, and the purpose of this is for interested proposers, and you don't have to be a company at the time you submit a pitch, you can just be an individual. Um, uh, but interested, interested applicants submit this brief document that we call the project pitch. We review these project pitches and the purpose of reviewing them is to assess whether or not the idea appears to be a fit with the program. So it's important to appreciate that these project pitches and the review of these pitches is not a pre-review of your proposal. It's really just an assessment of fit with the program. And so you can submit a project pitch, you'll receive a response. We try and get responses back within three weeks and you will either receive an invitation to submit prepare and submit a phase one proposal, or you'll receive uh, an uninvitation, but some feedback on why we believe that your pitch was not a good fit with the program. And so you, if it's not, and you think it would be, if you changed it, you can modify the pitch and resubmit. Uh, there are some constraints on the number of pitches that you can submit per uh, window. We have submission windows, three month submission windows, but you know, within those constraints, you can resubmit your pitch, having modified it, in accordance with the feedback that you've received if the pitch is not invited the first time. And so the purpose of this is really just to make sure that people who are interested in applying to the program don't go to the trouble of preparing a whole phase one proposal, which is a lot of work, only to find that their, their idea was not a fit with the program at all. Okay, um, so proposals which are submitted to the program are reviewed uh, by external reviewers. So we recruit people from academia, from industry, maybe from the investment community, from various places to review these proposals. And proposals are reviewed according to three broad review criteria. And you can actually go to the web address at the bottom of this slide, and you can read exactly what the review criteria are. But broadly speaking, they break down into intellectual merit, commercial potential, and broader impacts. And so, Intellectual merit really is referring to, you know, whether the project is based on a new leading edge technology innovation. Commercial potential, of course, is exactly what it sounds like. So we're looking to see that there appears to be a market opportunity for the innovation that you're proposing to develop and commercialize. And in, even in a phase one proposal, you need to present a reasonable case for there being a solid market opportunity. As you go into phase two, that commercialization piece of the proposal needs to be much stronger. But even at phase one, we require, you know, some reasonable justification that there is a, a, a good market opportunity. And then broader impacts, as I mentioned, is, uh, is uh, meant to reflect the 
potential for this innovation, if it's successfully developed and commercialized, to actually lead to some national benefit, some societal benefit, and so forth. Um, and ultimately, that's what we're looking for in this program is um, positive societal outcomes, whether it's economic or health-based or whatever, some positive benefits that will accrue to the public because after all, it's public money which is funding these companies. <clears throat> so a Im very important point to appreciate is that the program is basically technology agnostic. And so I've shown here, and this has actually changed <laughs> since I prepared this uh, presentation, but uh, I've shown here a list of uh, topics that we have, and you'll see it's a very broad list. Um, and what it really boils down to is that we will accept we're much more interested in whether a proposal meets our review criteria than uh, what particular technology space it's in. So as I said before, it's really up to the company to present um, a, a case that there is a market opportunity, there's a market need, and then a leading edge technology innovation that you're proposing to develop to meet that market need. That's re we're much more interested in that than in what specific technical area your proposal is in. So people, op people often ask us, well, are you interested in this? Are you interested in that? It's really the wrong question to ask us. The answer is we're interested in proposals that meet our review criteria. That's what it comes down to. So I, slow th I show this slide really just to emphasize the fact that we will look at technologies right across the spectrum. The only thing we really don't fund is clinical trials and drug development. Uh, those two things are funded by the NIH rather than by NSF. Okay, so I'm nearly finished here, but I thought I would leave you with some useful links. Um, uh, first link is just to our website, which has a ton of information in it. In, on that website, there's a page specifically for applicants, and you see the second link here. Uh, the, within that page, there's, a, there's a, a link to the project pitch, which is shown here. And also there's, a, uh, I think, a very useful FAQ on that web page, uh, which goes into a lot of detail about many different aspects of the program and uh, you know, how you submit a proposal, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully those resources will be useful to you. And with that, I'm finished uh, with what I wanted to say, and I'm happy now to turn my attention to some of the questions that have come in. Okay, uh, so let me just go back to the start and I'll so some of these, I'll, I'll try and pick the, the questions which I think are most likely to be of interest to a number of people. So how does a company know it's ready to apply? That's a very good question. So we, we do fund companies at very early stages. Um, if you have, so it, when you prepare and submit a proposal, it's important that you actually have a decent idea or a fairly specific idea of what the innovation is that you are looking to develop and have a credible plan for actually developing it. So we sometimes get pitches and usually we will send them back and ask for more details, but we sometimes get pitches where someone says, well, here's the issue that I want to address, but they don't tell us how they're going to do it. So that's premature. You really need to be able to present not just the problem, but how you're going to address it and what is the specific technical innovation that you propose to develop and how do you propose to go about doing it? And so I think when you're, once you're at that point, you've convinced yourself that there's a good market opportunity, you have a good idea of what you're going to be doing to actually address that opportunity. I think, that's, I think at that point, you are certainly ready to submit a project pitch and get some feed, get, receive an invitation or if it's not ready to be invited, receive some feedback. Uh, three things uh, applicants should be sure to do with the SBIR application. Um, well, so I think I've, I've covered some of them. So first of all, you do need to describe the market opportunity. We don't expect you to have all the answers at phase one, start of phase one, but you do need to present a reasonable case that you understand what the market opportunity is. Uh, you need to describe the technology that you propose to develop and how you're going to be developing it um, and include some success metrics associated with that project. So at the end of it, how are you going to measure your own success? And the other thing which you can do in a phase one application 
which I think really strengthens the application uh, is to include letters of support. You can include up to three letters of support in a phase one proposal. And the best letters are from organizations in your end user space. <clears throat> so they might be they might be customers, potential customers. Uh, they might be um, industry associations, but organizations that can validate the market opportunity that you are claiming exists in your proposal, you're claiming actually does exist. Okay, let me just skip down here. Let's see if I can find some more questions. I mean, there's plenty of questions, but see if I can find some. Okay, here's a question. If a company has submitted a proposal in the past and it was not funded, does that damage the company's chances if they try again? Um, the answer is no, it doesn't. In fact, we have tons of evidence to support what I just said. I mean, many of our really good companies, very strong companies, received their phase one award on the second or third or even the fourth attempt. And so there is no stigma associated with resubmitting a phase one proposal, none at all. Uh, so you shouldn't be concerned about that. Um, oh, notable graduates, I mean, there are many companies that have come out of the program that, have, that are well known. Qualcomm is probably one that people mention quite often, but uh, there are plenty of other applicants that have come out of the program as well that have been very successful. They may not be household names like uh, Qualcomm, but they're still very, very successful. Um, okay, so let me just have a look for another question. Uh, what's happening here? So I answered the question about drug development. We don't fund drug development. Uh, funds can be used to support general administra and administrative costs. They should be those those that request for funds should be included in indirect costs. You'll see that in the budget when you actually prepare your phase one budget. Uh, proposal status is listed as pending and is not no, and it and it is known it was reviewed but not recommended or awarded. What exactly does that mean? It just means that it actually it's it's in processing at some point. So there's a lot of post processing after a proposal has been reviewed. And sometimes when we do uh, reviews, if they're done via ad hoc, we may not have all the reviews in. I mean, we had quite a bit of difficulty with that last year because of COVID. It was very difficult to secure reviewers. And um, oftentimes we had to replace reviewers because of complications due to COVID. So I'm not being critical of reviewers. Um, but so it doesn't necessarily mean anything. I know it's a bit of a black box when you submit your proposal and you don't quite know what's happening with it. Uh, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean anything if it still shows pending. Um, what is a typical reviewer background? Uh, we use rev different types of reviewers. So um, for my topics, which include AI and cybersecurity and cloud and high performance computing and quantum information technologies, at phase one, I typically uh, use almost exclusively researchers at phase one, but, but other program directors in other topics will sometimes use a mix of commercial and technical reviewers at phase one. Uh, going into phase two, phase two review panels are typically a mix of technical and commercial reviewers, roughly 50-50. So as I mentioned before, the commercial aspects of a phase two proposal are, are very important, much more so than at phase one. And so we often, uh, will always use commercial reviewers to some extent, and often commercial reviewers at phase two will account for about 50% of the panel composition. Just excuse me. Um, so there's a question here about pharmaceutical science. Uh, we do actually have a pharmaceutical um, topic. So if you want to get a better idea of what we fund, you can actually go to, the to our website which was on the previous slide that I showed a minute ago. <clears throat> I go to this first link here, and I think it's on the front page of the website. You can actually go to the bottom of the page and you, there's a little, uh, I think it's a yellow box there that indicates you can search for current awardees. 
and you can break it down by topic. So you can look and see the types of programs, uh, uh, sorry, projects that we have funded in the pharmaceutical space. So we do, it's a very active topic, but we just don't fund uh, actual drug development. So, so I'm looking for more questions. I don't see any at the moment. So if you have questions, please do submit them. Excuse me. Okay, so we have a question. Is there a process to change suppliers or subcontractors from what you listed initially in your budget? Um, there is. I mean, if you've received an award, it's actually very easy to do that. You just talk to your program director and you'll be asked probably to supply the same information that you would have had to supply in the original budget. But if you have a good rationale for changing, um, you know, consultants or contractors or subcontractors, uh, we don't normally don't have a problem with that. It's normally a very straightforward process. I think you can change the budget perhaps while the uh, prior to review as well after you submit the project, but the pr proposal, but certainly uh, after award, you can modify the budget with, the, you know, with the approval of the program director. And as I mentioned, we are really not resistant to that. As long as there's a good reason for it, we're not resistant to that at all. Just, to, just like pivots. I mean, changes in direction of the whole project. We're not resistant to changes in direction as long as they're evidence-based. That's the main thing. <clears throat> Um, so there's a question here about FDA uh, submittal. My under so I don't deal with this, um, and you would probably be well advised to submit a question, send a question to, uh, for example, Dr. Henry Ahn, A H N, who manages uh, the medical devices topic. My understanding is that we do not allow our funds to be used for um, to fund uh, FDA applications. Uh, but I would, uh, my uh, suggestion is that you follow up with Henry Ahn on that, and I think you'll find he will confirm that. Uh, um, do I recommend reaching out to the program manager in advance of submitting a pitch? I generally don't recommend that, not unless you've got a really specific question. I mean, the pitch is a very light lift. It's, you know, we, we asked for information in four different sections. It's only uh, you know, 1,500 words maximum total. So it's a very light lift. And to be really blunt, I mean, we are so pressed for time that we we can't answer every pre-pitch question. And so to be fair, we can't answer any really. I mean, that generally speaking, that's the case. There are some exceptions, but we just can't <clears throat> we just can't do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And after all, the purpose of the pitch is to determine whether your idea is a fit with the program. We're not looking to pre-review your proposal. We're just looking to see whether you actually have an innovation or not. And if you do, then almost certainly you'll, you'll receive a, an invitation to, to submit a proposal. So, but it's very, it would be very difficult, difficult for us to, uh, to handle you know, all the pre-pitch questions that we're likely to receive, to be honest. Uh, timeline from submission to notice of award, you know, over, over the past year, it's been very tough for us to maintain our normal timeline, but the normal timeline is uh, four to six months after submit, after the submission deadline to which you submit your proposal. So we've got a June deadline coming up. If you submit in, say, May, we would, the, the for us, the clock starts in early June when the submission deadline is. Uh, and then we would hope to get responses back to you within four to six months of that deadline. It's been difficult over the last year just because last year we were completely swamped with COVID-based proposals. Um, there's a question about what stages of the review process you, you see on research.gov. I'm actually not 100% sure, but I know you don't get much granularity. I mean, I think... Uh, in fact, I don't know that you see much other than pending until you actually finally receive either a communication from the program director if they're looking for more information or an, a declination or an award notice. 
So I don't think there's much else that you receive in the meantime. There's not much we can tell you while the deliberations are going on, to be honest. <clears throat> and if a program director needs more information, he or she will definitely reach out to you. Um, a company's business can be a home or residence, but you have to be a little bit careful. If it's a type of enterprise, that, like a you know purely computer-based, and it's credible that you could work out of a home address, that's usually fine for phase one. Going into phase two, reviewers generally look for an actual office address. But if you're doing work that requires you know, hardware and so forth, a home address may not be so credible. Now, I know there are some you know, difficulties during COVID, and so we are trying to be as flexible as we can, and you probably won't get dinged for having a home address as the company address at this point. But just be aware that particularly as you go into phase two, if you've got a project that requires lab space, you know, you need to be able to convince reviewers that you actually have access to that lab space to do the work that you're proposing to do. Uh, but as I say, during COVID, we are trying to be as um, flexible as we can about these sorts of issues. Um, is SPI or STTR funding agnostic to technologies relevant to COVID-19? I'm not quite sure what that means. We ran a COVID-19 track last year, which we closed uh, at the end of May. We had a dear colleague later, which is a you know an announcement of a funding opportunity. Uh, but those proposals still ran through our regular. Uh, once once they got past the pitch stage, they ran through our regular review process. But we closed that off at the end of May last year. So you absolutely you can submit proposals which are COVID relevant. Uh, but they will no longer be fast tracked relative to other proposals. Um, and if you do, but if you do do that, I would my strong suggestion is that you you include the term COVID-19 somewhere in the title. That's a signal, you know, to, for us to uh, that this is a COVID-19 based uh, proposal. Um, do we offer any incentives or special recruitment opportunities for underrepresented groups? I mean, we have we don't offer any particular recruitment opportunities in terms of proposals, but we do do a lot of outreach uh, to underrepresented groups, uh, and we try we are we do our best to try and encourage proposals from, you know, all sectors of the community and particularly um, underrepresented groups. I mean, we have a very uh, active and vibrant diversity and inclusion and broadening participation. Um, uh, program. So uh, we try and attract uh, people from those communities into the program. We don't, though, make any distinction once a proposal reaches the program in terms of reviewing the proposals. They're all reviewed according to the same uh, review criteria. Uh, do we have a data point on how many awardees do not get to market in a given cycle? Uh, it depends what you mean by get to market. Um, and in terms of awardees getting to market, I mean, I think companies that reach phase two, we have a very high success rate of those companies. Okay, actual commercialization, I see it. So we have a companies that get to phase two, I think there's a very high success rate of those companies being commercially impactful. Uh, and by that, I mean, they actually do form uh, relationships with customers, they make sales, they get, they they receive VC investments and so forth. Whether a company is ultimately successful though takes a lot longer than just our phase one and phase generally takes a lot longer than just our phase one and phase two award periods, and so it's very difficult for us to tell in the long term how um, you know how effectively they actually do get to market. Probably the best way is through of knowing is through the this, the slide I showed earlier about acquisitions. You know, companies that are acquired that are acquired. In a sense, the technology is guaranteed then to get to market because the acquirer wants to buy them because of the technology, because it will you know allow them better market access. But if they're a company that's already established, they already have market access. And so, you know, for companies that are acquired, I think that acquired, I think there is a sort of a guarantee that their technology will actually get to market in some way, shape or form. And so I think the, the vast majority of phase two companies do in some form get to market, whether they're ultimately long-term 
successful and impactful is a different question. It's very difficult for us to actually assess that in terms of hard statistics. Uh, let me see. Um, is it possible for your technology be, to be too far along for SBIR? Absolutely it is. So we do have companies sometimes that apply to the program and they've already received, you know, multiple rounds of funding for VCs. They already have a product which is which is commercialized and they're looking to make some incremental improvement to the product or service. Under those circumstances, and this is actually cl very clearly spelled out in the solicitation, under those circumstances, they're probably not a good fit with the program for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. You know, we are looking to fund companies at the earliest possible stage. Um, sorry, my camera just off, just turned off. Let me turn it back on. We are looking to fund companies at the earliest possible stage um, in order that our money can actually make a significant difference to that company. You know, so if a company's already received several rounds of funding, it's it, it's well advanced, it has products out in the marketplace or services out in the marketplace, it's pro in most cases, it's gonna to be too far along for the SPIR, STTR program. Um, any suggestions for what a company should do if they've received one or more SPR awards, but VC traditional investment is still not yet interested? Uh, well, so it depends. <laughs> That's the universal answer. It depends. Um, it depends on the reason why no one's in, you know, VC or traditional investors are not interested. So it may, there may be a good reason for those investors not being interested, but Oftentimes, if a company has been funded by us, you know, phase one and phase two, we don't normally fund companies twice. In other words, if they go through the cycle once, normally we don't fund them to go through again. It does happen sometimes, but there needs to be a strong case for that. Um, but if at the end of all that, they can't find funding anywhere and they really are, you know, um, looking uh, in the right way for money, then I think, you know, you've got to regard that as a sign that maybe the product market fit has not been worked through as thoroughly as it could be. And so I think, I mean, I know if I were in that position, I'd receive money, I'd develop the technology, I'd try to market it and, you know, with some success maybe, and investors were not interested. I would take that as a very, very strong signal that I'm doing something wrong. You know, and what I'm doing wrong probably is I haven't got the product market fit right. Um, and I can tell you from my own experience, I mean, I made <laughs> I made mistakes in this area for years. Um, it, getting the product market fit right sounds so easy and yet it's very difficult. It takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of vigilance and it takes a very open mind and it, it requires you to be intellectually honest with yourself about you know, whether you're the baby that you've developed, which you think is beautiful, is actually beautiful to other people or ugly to other people, you know? And so if 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 you think it's beautiful, but nobody wants to buy it, maybe it's not, just not hitting the mark. Um, and so I would take that as a sign to really look carefully, maybe do some more customer discovery and figure out whether you really understand the market properly. Um, so anyway, for what it's worth, that's, what I, that's how I would interpret that. Um, what percentage of successful awards don't partner with a university or research institution? So we have, as I said, you know, the program involves SBIR and STTR. Uh, the, both of those uh, types of proposals are reviewed according to the same review criteria. The difference is that STTR must include a sub-award to a university. And the idea of the STTR, which was developed, um, I think about 15, 20 years after SBIR, was that it was intended to promote spin outs from universities. So an indirect answer to the question is that uh, about 90 to 95% of the proposals we receive are SBIR, not STTR. So even though they may have some university lineage in some cases, um, they're, they're not relying on university uh, involvement to move the technology forward. 
So it's a small proportion that are actually relying on a connection to a technology uh, that's being spun out of a university and relying on university resources to help them develop the technology and commercialize it. Uh, most companies, even if they are actually taking advantage of some technology that has university lineage, most of the companies that we fund are not still reliant on that university presence in order to move the technology forward. That's a kind of an indirect answer to the question, but maybe it helps. Uh, so the difference between SBIR and STTR is purely the requirement for a sub in the case of an STTR proposal, there, there is a requirement that at least 30% of the total budgeted amount must be spent on one or more sub awards to not for profit research inst institutions, which is almost always universities. Okay, so at least 30% must be spent on one or more sub awards to universities. At least 40% must be spent within the company, and the other 30% can go either way in the case of an STTR. Now, in the case of an SBIR, it's kind of reversed. Uh, you can still have a subaward to a university with an SBIR if you want, but the maximum amount of the subaward is one third of the total budgeted amount for the for the project overall. So that's the difference between SBIR and STTR. There is no difference in terms of uh, the requirements for principal investigator employment or anything else. Everything else is the same. So even in the case of an STTR, just like an SBIR, the principal investigator must be more than 50% employed by the small business, by the company that's applying. Uh, so a faculty member who wants to be a principal investigator on an award, and we're fine with that in principle, but they have to, they have to actually be employed by that small business for 51% or more of the time, of their time during the period of the award. For most faculty who don't want to take a leave of absence or you know something like that, that's not possible for most. Some do take a leave of absence or a sabbatical or something like that, and they will go and join the company and maybe be 100% employed by the company during the course of the of the project. And that's great. We, I mean, I, that's a really good uh, outcome for us, in my opinion. But if they can't do that, then what happens often is the faculty will remain at the university maybe spend up to 20% of their time uh, at the company as a part-time employee. A lot of universities will allow up to 20%. Uh, and then, for example, a PhD, a, a postdoc or PhD student uh, that the faculty knows and is comfortable with their level of expertise might become the principal investigator at the company. So that's a model that we see a lot. I see it a lot in my topics and it actually works very well. As long as everyone's properly motivated and incentivized in that structure, that arrangement, uh, I've seen it work very well many times. Uh, anyway, so that's a long-winded way of answering the, the question about employment requirements. Um, so uh, success rates. So I'll give you the phase one and phase two success rates. And you know, please understand these are just averages. They're always exceptions. So. The success rate for applicants at phase one, so this is a uh, success rate based on the number of proposals submitted, not the number of pitches, the number of proposals submitted is around 15 to 20%. So around 15 to 20% of phase one proposals that are submitted uh, receive an award. And then going from phase one to phase two, the percentage is significantly higher. And it varies a lot going from phase one to phase two varies a lot from cycle to cycle and probably from topic to topic, you know, and cycle to cycle. But typically, you know, going from phase one to phase two, the award rate is more like, you know, 35 to 50%. So it's much higher, but there's still no guarantee. Even if you receive a phase one, there's absolutely no guarantee that you receive a phase two. Phase two is actually, even though the award rate is high going to phase two, it's much more competitive because everyone that you're competing against going from phase one to phase two has already been filtered out and is a strong company. You know, so the competition going to phase two is very strong, but the award rate is significantly higher. Um, I've never been to Tennessee. <laughs> I've never been, never been to Tennessee, I'm, I'm afraid, no. I'd love to visit, but I've just never been there. Oh no. Well, post COVID, Peter, we might have to change that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to, I would love to come and visit actually. Thank you, Ali.
Um, well, thank you for just your thoughtful answers to the questions and the presentation. Um, I know a lot of, um, we had a lot of questions answered in a short period of time, which is, which is wonderful. So That's I appreciate yeah. you spending your time with us. Um, for those of you who are on the line who want to hear more about um, Launch Tennessee's resources, specifically as it relates to um, SBIR, but also, you know, um, we've got plenty of other, other initiatives as well, but um, feel free to reach out to me um, by email. My email is Allie, which you can see how it's spelled right here. Um, at launchtn.org, um, and I'm happy to connect you and kind of point you in the right direction, um, especially if you are, you know, going to pursue SBIR, but um, if you're just looking to get connected in Tennessee's entrepreneurial ecosystem, um, looking for other sources of investment, um, we can help with that as well. So thanks again, Peter, for your time today, um, and thank you all for joining thank us. Thank you, Ellie, and thanks, everybody.